Here we go, brand new conversation. Hey, real quick, too, uh, we don't steal that stuff. Peyton, props to you. Uh, Peyton, who was up here earlier, she created that video, so thank you so much for doing that. Uh, but I want to tell you today, we're starting a brand new conversation called Me and My Emotions. Me and My Emotions. And I know that you probably know this, but... Uh, we haven't been short on feeling them in the past year and a half, two years. We, we've had plenty, and I'll be honest, I, I've, I think I've felt about all of them. I, I had someone give me an, an emotion wheel recently, and I, I thought I connected with the, the, the six words that were in the center, and then there were all these extra sub words. There were about 60 words. I'm like, oh, I've felt all 60 of those in the past two years. Uh, and what the goal of this conversation that we're going to have is this idea of what to do when your faith and your feelings are misaligned. What are you going to do when your faith and your feelings are misaligned? Uh, and maybe you've been there as well, that you, you have this faith, but then you have your feelings, and, and some of you have been trusting and following your feelings, and, and that's not going to take you too, too far. Uh, and so you need to get centered again back on following your faith so what are you going to do when your faith and your feelings are misaligned that's what we're talking about with me and my emotions and if you're you're uh, you need like a smart communicator would probably give you this at the very end like in four to six weeks uh, but i'll give it to you now uh, if you need to know like the nutshell of the whole next six weeks what in the world? How do I like anchor this in one verse? Here it is. This is good news. Like if you miss everything for the next six weeks, at least you got to get this. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And it says this. It says, Tr uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. So don't trust your feelings. Don't trust your feelings. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. So we want to make sure that you are following your faith in this conversation, not your feelings. And we, we are, I've been so wrestling through this personally uh, that we have read uh, a number of books at my home. Uh, so we have we made available today at the resource wall. Uh, you, you can pay for these. We're not giving them away today. Sorry, but uh, you can pay for these books if this is where you're at. If you're going to connect with this conversation, uh, Amber recently read a book written by Jenny Allen called "Get Out of Your Head." Get out of your head, and it is. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've read about half of it, and it is um, targeted in a way that girls, you're probably going to like it better than guys. So get out of your head. So we put that available uh, at the resource wall, uh, and then you need to know this, <clears throat> guys. I, I'm going through. I'm just about to wrap up a book right now by Craig Rochelle called "Winning the Winning the War in Your Mind," and this is uh, a huge piece. It's kind of the same book, but one's written for girls, one's written for guys. Uh, so, winning the war in your mind. So, if this is where you're at, if you're stuck somewhere between your feelings and your faith, and that you know they're a little bit jacked up right now, that get those books. They're they're those books. Uh, the way they communicate them, the way they point you to God's scripture, uh, it has been super helpful to us. Uh, another book that's not out, that maybe you want to get it, uh, it's a secular book, but there's a book by this guy named Colin Henderson that's called Mastering Your Mindset. Mastering Your Mindset is another book that's been huge for me in the past year, year and a half, by Colin Henderson called Master Your Mindset. Uh, but this is just those are tools that are going to help you uh, if you need to go deeper uh, in this conversation with me and my emotions and what to do when your feelings and your faith are misaligned. Today, uh, we're going to jump into, we're going to talk about loneliness. If you got a bulletin, you would have seen lonely, uh, but I'm going to read a quick little small text to you, and this is a prayer uh, straight from David, right out of Psalm 25, 16 to 18. And we don't know what David is stressing out about, uh, 
But clearly he's wrestling with something in Psalm 25, 16 to 18. And although I don't know all the context, I don't know what was going on in David's world with this prayer specific, I, I, the words that he says in the prayer like, oh, <laughs> I've said that this past year. And so see if you connect with it. In Psalm 25, 16 to 18, it says this. Turn to me and have mercy. For I am alone and in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from them all. Feel my pain and see my trouble. I don't know what David's praying about, but I, I, I see what his emotions are, where he's at. And I think, oh, I so connect with that. And so today, for week number one of Me and My Emotions, I want to talk uh, to you from this title, uh, Help. I'm full of distress and loneliness. Help. I'm full of distress and loneliness. Hey, let me open us a word of prayer, and then we're going to get started. God, thank you so much uh, for everybody that's in the room. And I I don't know what everybody in the room is feeling. I don't know what they're walking in here with. Maybe somebody just had the best Saturday of all time yesterday, and they're in great shape. But God, I know there's people in the room this morning that, that are full of distress, that they're stressed out, that they're lonely, uh, that they feel like they're in isolation. They feel like nobody knows where they're at and what's going on. God, I just ask in this time we have together today that that you'd show up, that you would help somebody connect with you, that you would help uh, somebody understand the importance of community. Uh, God, I ask that you would speak through me, that you'd get me out of the way right now. God, we, we need you. God, I'm asking that you'd go before us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So help, I'm full of distress and loneliness. Uh, my first real, real memory that I have of feeling like some sort of distress and loneliness uh, in the seventh grade, in the seventh grade, I tried out for the Matt Toom Middle School basketball team. And this is not going to surprise that many of you, but the, in the seventh grade, there was a first cut and there was a second cut, and I, may, I missed the first cut. They had one week of practice, and then they had two more nights of practice. They were going to narrow the team down from 20 to 15. I thought, this is going to be fine. You know, I, I feel good about where I'm at. I played in the Y League. I thought, this is not going to be that big of a deal. Seventh grade, I missed the first cut. And then somebody had the audacity in between the seventh grade and the eighth grade to tell me, like, Michael Jordan, uh, he got cut from his freshman basketball team. And, and so, hey, you, you got to keep going. You got to take this as motivation. I said, yeah, I'm really motivated. And so I went back for the eighth grade. I thought I was going to be Michael Jordan. My mom had got me a Michael Jordan air attack basketball hoop at this point. I thought, I am here to stay. This is the start of a, I mean, this is going to be a legendary career. And so in the eighth grade, in the eighth grade, I was the same height I am now. In the eighth grade, I, I, I tried out for the team, and, and the same system, same thing was set up that, that we had uh, first week of practice, and here's what happened. I made the first cut. I made the first cut. So I, my confidence, like uh, uh, the, the reps have been paying off. The Friday night, Monday to Friday night practice came and went, and I had made the first cut. And then there were going to be two more nights of practice. And I was so confident. I, I think this was, somebody should have stopped me. Uh, but I, I actually, I, I had decided the night of our last practice, uh, the second practice of the second cut, the second round of tryouts, uh, I decided I was going to go hang out with three other kids who had previously been on the basketball team in the seventh grade. And so I'm hanging out at my friend's house, who was like Michael Jordan of Mattoon Middle School. And I'm hanging out at his house, and I'm hanging out with a couple other guys that, that were on the team the previous year. Uh, and I, I will never forget this. I've gotten over this, but I remember this, uh, that we got a call that the, the millennials or next generation, you're going to find this shocking. We got a call uh, that, hey, the, the roster has been placed on the door at the middle school. And I was at my friend's house with three other kids 
that were on the team the previous year. So we got in my mom's, uh, we got in my friend's mom's Plymouth Voyager, and we went to we went to the Mattoon Middle School, and we pulled up, and we all piled out of that car, and there was one name not on the roster, and I had missed the cut again, and somehow I was in this social situation where y'all made the team, and now we got to all go all back to your house, and this is what I felt is like total distress and isolation. I wanted, I felt loneliness. I want, hey, can you just have your mom drop me off at my house? I want to just slip into isolation. I don't like the way this feels. I just want to kind of go unnoticed for a minute. And this is what I've come to know about, uh, I've recovered from the basketball career, uh, but here, this is what I've come to know is like, anytime like I want to slip into isolation, anytime I want to slip into like loneliness, there's like a story behind it. There's something going on. And maybe you're feeling shame, maybe you're taking the blame for something, whatever it will be, you, 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 there's some sort of story behind your loneliness and your distress. And this is what I know in regard to me and my emotions and feeling lonely in the last couple of years, is I know so many people who, who have lost uh, jobs, they've lost important key relationships, they've missed out on a promotion, they've had a kid go prodigal, they have a kid that's posting things on Facebook, and they're over 18, and they're like, I know, I wish I could stop it, but what can I do? And you just want to like slip into isolation, and you want to slip into loneliness, or your, your marriage is messed up, and it's not going well, and rather than communicate it with somebody, you, we, we choose isolation, and let, let's just hide. Let, let's not talk about it. Let's, I don't want this to be out in the light. Maybe you had a big plan. We had some plans. I had some plans. God's doing something different. But I had some plans here at the church at the start of 2020. And I had some people that were with me. And the pandemic happened. And now I look around like, wow, what happened? And there were some seasons in the last 18 to 24 months. That I just wanted to slip into isolation. And I felt nothing but distress and loneliness. And this is what I'm learning about feeling that way, and then about responding by saying, well, I'm going to choose isolation. And it, Proverbs 18.1, it says it like this, that this is Solomon. The, this is the wisest guy in the Old Testament. He says, one who isolates himself pursues selfish desires, and he rebels against sound wisdom. Maybe you're in that spot that you want to isolate yourself rather, and you, you want to pursue selfish desires and you're rebelling against sound wisdom. It made me think this week, uh, it made me think this week about a song that maybe you'll know by John Mayer. He had this song out called Perfectly Lonely. Some of you know the song, and I'm not going to sing it, but I will read the lyrics. I'll leave the singing to the singers. Uh, but John Mayer said, I got nothing to do. I'm trying hard not to sing it. Uh, <laughs> nowhere to be. No. <laughs> Amber's at the 11. She said, hey, whatever you do, do not sing that song. <laughs> okay. A simple little kind of free. I'm perfectly lonely. I got nothing to do, nowhere to be, a simple little kind of free. I'm perfectly lonely. And then John says, yeah. I say, no. Solomon says, no. You're not, lonely cannot be a lifestyle. You, you just think about it. Don't say it out loud, but the craziest people you know are not in community. They're alone with themselves. They start, you think of, think of, you know, some, you know, a person that doesn't hang out with people and what they begin to listen to on a regular basis is themselves. They get so wild and crazy. They begin to answer themselves. They begin to have out loud conversations with themselves. The, 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 some of the craziest people we've come across, they're in no community. 
Some of you are like, I don't know if I actually believe that. You ever watch Castaway? By the end of Castaway, this dude is, I don't know what the, char- what the name of the character in Castaway was, but I know this, this volleyball he was talking to was Wilson. I mean, he got, he so desperately needed community, and he got so crazy with it that he starts talking to a volleyball. That you, when you lo- live in a lifestyle of loneliness and isolation, you, you're going to start doing some crazy things. You're going to lose touch with common sense. You need people in your life. You, I know it's, it's your natural reaction. It's my natural reaction to be like, can you just drop me off at my mom's? Can, can we just act like nobody saw that? Can we, I'm not, I'm not going to say that out loud. I, I, how dare someone know what's going on in my world? And, or you're just sick and tired of people and you've been hurt and broken. I, I'm actually I'm going to resist community. You are not wired and you are not meant to do life alone. And starting with Adam and Eve, and God is completely okay with the fact that you need more. You need people. You need people to walk with you. You, you have to leave behind your lifestyle of loneliness and isolation. And when you're in the midst of distress, that's when you want to creep back into it. And so here's the good news. I'm going to give you like five quick ways straight from the scripture, of what you can do when, to battle this whole idea or this whole lifestyle of loneliness. The first, I'll give you a heads up, the first one's not very deep, but you should do it. Number one is this, this is number one right here, is you should talk to God. You should talk to, you, you have to start somewhere. And maybe you've been like the dude in Castaway, and you're talking to a volleyball, I would start by talking to God. That God so gets you. He so understands you. Jesus has been in your shoes. He can empathize with you. Within the last 18 months, um, I can tell you this. For just myself, my, my communication with other pastors has never been more than it is right now. This is why I like talking on a regular basis. I, I'm t- this has actually never stopped. But on a regular basis, I, I communicate and text and meet with Scott Sims. Uh, you need to know this. That, that there's another guy, that, a local pastor, Travis Spencer, pastors the Fields Church and Matt Toon and Charleston. I so have enjoyed and loved leaning into those guys in this season like never before. And this is why I like them so much is because they understand the content. I don't have to give them and try to explain church and explain people and explain situations like, yep, we had that last month. Sometimes I want to say to Scott, like... uh, you, you know, you're never even going to believe this. And then I start to, oh, yeah, I actually remember when. And the, Oh, that same thing. They so get the context. You think about talking to God. He so gets right where you're at. And, and here's another thing that will creep you out a little bit, especially if you're not following Jesus. He already knows what you're thinking and feeling. He, already, he, he doesn't even need to know the context. That you can talk so straight with God. And I, I, one thing that I'm thankful for in this season of, of what has felt difficult and sometimes what has felt like uh, distress and loneliness, uh, I've gotten so desperate at times that it's pretty easy to communicate with God. It's pretty easy. Uh, I can say this about me, that my relationship with God has never been more real, has never been more raw. I I have given, and not that this doesn't work, so don't try it, but I've given God ultimatums. I have, I've told God, this is what I need, so you need to do it, and this is actually my time and schedule. He doesn't seem to care, but you have got to start communicating. Okay, so people scare you. Start by talking to your heavenly Father. He created you. He gets the context. Jesus has been in your shoes. Look, again, what David said in Psalm 27. This is David. And if you need to talk to God, David said it like this. Hear me. 
as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. I've said that a hundred times in the past 24 months. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Verse 9, it says, do not turn your back on me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me. Oh, God of my salvation. Maybe you've had a desperate prayer like this. Maybe, maybe you have lost. I've had some go-to people in my life that have gone away in the last 24 months. It has made me, I'm going to talk to God. Verse 10, maybe you'll connect with this. Even if my father and mother abandoned me. Maybe you've had someone so close to you abandon you in this season. That you're full of distress and loneliness because your go-to's gone. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. In other translations, it says, the Lord will not forsake me. I'm going to start by talking to the guy that's constant, the guy that his word is consistent. That's my favorite kind of friend, the, the one who's always there, the one who keeps saying the same things, the one that I can count on, the one that won't forsake me, that God will never forsake you, God will never leave you, God will never abandon you, that in Psalm 23, he's with you in the shadow of your d- darkest valleys, he's there with you. He's Emmanuel, God with us. You, you need to start by talking to your heavenly Father. So that's number one. That's not very deep. We know that. If you're following Jesus, you talk to God. You start in prayer. It, you, get real with God. Like We've been talking way, way, way too religious with God. He's your heavenly Father. Number two. This gets a little darker. Sorry. Stop listening to the lies. Stop listening to the lies. The biggest, the two biggest liars in my life is my inner voice and Satan. Those are the two biggest liars in my life. Let's just start with yourself. Just you and yourself, not me and yourself. Just you and yourself. Colin Henderson says it this way in Mastering Your Mindset. Think about your friends. Think about your friends. If they talk to you the way you talk to yourself, would you still be friends with them? Uh Uh-uh. Stop listening to the lies. Stop tormenting yourself with what you should have done. Colin says it like this. If if you're in your head, you're dead. Stop. Stop. Listening to you. Number two is this idea to stop letting Satan talk to you. You get off in loneliness and isolation. That is right where Satan wants you. You're holding on to some sort of distress and nobody knows about it. Nobody can know about this. And I'm feeling lonely about this. I don't want to talk about this. I've had these situations and I say something to Scott about it. I say something to Travis about it. I say something to the elders about it. <laughs> we get it. And it's like, you ha- Stop listening to Satan. He is beating you up and you're allowing it. About six months ago, we had this, I, I had this, Facebook did this thing to me uh, where they, pu- they pulled up a memory you have a situation ever where Facebook likes to like make you feel bad or make you feel like, wow, time really goes fast. We get these all the time with our kids. We're like, we think that was last weekend. We're like, that was four years ago. Recently, I had Facebook kind of taunt me, and this memory came up, and, and there were some people that we were doing ministry with, and this was just three years ago, uh, and there were ten people in the picture. And I'm looking through the picture, and seven of the ten people are gone. And three people still with me in the picture, myself, my wife, and my mom. The 
middle of the night on Facebook, I start thinking, it's me. It's me. It's me. Who's the common denominator in all of that? Me. Satan begins to have a hate. You didn't even get started. You're done. I don't want to talk to anybody about this. I just want to go in silence. I don't, nobody else understands this. Nobody gets where I'm at. And they start beating myself up. Uh, I finally had the guts to communicate it with one of my friends, Josh Norman. He tells me recently we we're playing golf. He said, stop saying that stuff. That's not your own and stuff that's not yours. Stop talking to yourself like that. Stop it. Where is it? Where is it that you're believing the lies that the enemies are telling? This is what I honestly know about you that I have to tell myself, that God's going to see you through what he called you to. That you, you, I would tell you all day long, stop identifying in your failures. But yet for me, just like you, I, oh, I so identify with some of my failures. And Satan loves to remind me about it. Stop listening to the lies. You are not done. And I don't know what your plans were, but you're in distress and you're full of loneliness and you just say, I'm going to slip away and be done. And I say, no. Stop listening to the lies. That Colin Henderson would say, if you're in your head, you're dead. Get out. Get out. He, Colin Henderson talks about ants in your mind. Automatic negative thoughts. Ants. You got ants in your head. That you instantly, that, oh, it's me. I own it. You over own stuff that's not yours to pick up. You, you take fault. You identify in things, you, past failures. You identify for things that are paid for. All the while, God's saying, I sent my son for you. Like, you stop it. Let it go. Stop believing the lies. Paul tells the Corinthians like this. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, he says this, that we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You get a thought that does not align with God's word and what he says about you. You get a hold of it and you say, no, 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 Satan, look at this. Stop with the ant. Don't, don't, don't let the ants go wild. Don't let Satan talk to you. You've got to get in community. And number three is this that you should choose communication over isolation. That you should choose communication over, isol- and, over isolation. It is so natural. For you to not want to do that. This is just a couple of things I jotted down in regard to communication over isolation. Is, is I thought about this just this past week that uh, Daryl Phillips, Daryl Phillips, you know him, uh, he's on our staff. That he has such a discernment about him. That he can know what's going on in my life and he can know something's wrong without me saying anything. It's incredibly annoying. <laughs> that he can say, hey, I saw you acting like that. I, saw, I, see, I see you, uh, this issue, I see this going on. What's going on? And stop making, this is the thing I'm learning about Daryl. Stop making people be like prophecy. Like put it, make it prophesying over your life. Like, Why, you're a prophet. You know what's going on. No, I just have decent discernment. That, have you ever thought about like this in regard to communication and isolation? Like you would tell physically, physically, you would tell a doctor almost anything about yourself and you don't even know them. Think about it. You haven't gone to the bathroom in three days, three weeks. I don't, just look at me, figure it out. Here I am. I, you don't even know them. Some of you are like, I got a runny nose. I got to go. Like, but spiritually, oh, no. I'm not going to talk to you about that. I have some elders at the church. That they've allowed me to say some pretty stupid things over the last two years. They, they've allowed me just to talk it out. 
I've sent them texts. I've talked with them. I've played disc golf with them. I, I've sat here on Saturday mornings. I don't know if it's me. I don't know what the, they just let me process. There's been some things for me that I have to own. This is what James 5.16 says. It says this. Uh, this is the brother of Jesus. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I read that over and over and over again this week. The cross saved me, but confession heals me. Stop choosing isolation. Be gutsy enough to choose and opt into communication. I love what Galatians 6, 2 to 3 says. It says, share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You're not that important. I think that's the tone Paul went with. Choose communication over isolation. You need to know this. Choose community over connection. You have 1,400 friends on Facebook. High five. Nobody knows what you're dealing with, though. And statistics say that we're, we're, we're the most anxious and most lonely and, and, and un... That's not a word, but uncommunity. I, I, I got to come up with... I got 11 o'clock to figure that out. But... We don't have real community. People don't really know what's going on. Here's something just to kind of scare you a little bit. But I think some of the hardest things to do is create, like in the season where you're being crushed, to try to all of a sudden then create community. It's, it's pretty awkward. You, you have to have community in place. And some of you are like, I, I got into church. I got in a small group. I had a friend. I shared something one time. Uh, I wish I would have never shared it. I wish somebody betrayed my trust. I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to expose myself. I don't know. I think I'm comfortable back here on Facebook and social media and chilling out with Netflix. No, 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 no. You need real community, and I get it, especially for dudes. Like I'm not letting anyone in because I had a bad experience. Here, I'll talk nonsense again. Amber and I, one time, we went to a macaroni grill. They're not local, so I'll throw them under the bus. Uh, I was going to be, woo! Uh, Amber and I went to a macaroni grill one time. We had, uh, we had a really bad experience. We, we actually, just to get totally transparent, we saw someone sneeze in our food and then, and then give us the food. Uh, so hang on. It's all right. But it's not all right. It's not all right at all. Uh, it was a bad experience. We have not stop going out to eat since then. The macaroni grill? We're not going to trust you. We haven't stopped communicating with other people, though. We haven't stopped living in community. Maybe, like, somebody jacked you up. Some church jacked you up. Somebody betrayed trust. And he's like, that's it, that's it, I'm out, I'm out. I'll settle for connection. But nobody knows. We never stop going out to eat, and we never stop doing community. We never stop getting real with people, even when there's been a time or two where someone has betrayed our trust. In the last year and a half, two years, it, it's never been a challenge, a, a bigger challenge to do life in community. In Hebrews 10, 25, it says it like this, and some of you will know this, but it says, this is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate the day dawning, that it is super critical that we stay connected, that we stay in community, that someone knows what you're walking through. 
Last one is this. Fundamental. Trust God. Trust God. Here's, here's the honesty uh, for me. Points, applications, the first four. Talking to God. Stop listening to the lies. Choosing community over connection. Choosing to communication over isolation. I can honestly say, I, like, not to be like, oh, I've honestly applied all of these. And there's still some areas in my life that I'm just waiting. And there's still some areas in my life that feel like distress. There's still some areas in my life like, I, God, I need you. I, I, I did steps one to four. Where are you? I've been doing this now for about eight weeks. I would encourage you to keep trusting, to not follow your feelings, to keep following your faith, to keep living it out. And maybe you're in a season of desolation and you're just wandering. And maybe you would connect with this. This is Death Valley. That that's Death Valley. And maybe that's where you're at in your life that you got nobody with you and it's dry and it hasn't rained for a long time and you you don't see anything new you don't see any produce from what you've been doing and you've been putting in the work and you've been trusting God and and this this picture in in Death Valley and uh, this is what you need to know it, it hardly ever rains in Death Valley and you feel like, well, that almost describes my life right now, that I'm in complete desolation. Uh, and it, this is what I would encourage you to do if this is where you're at, is to keep planting seeds, is to keep trusting God in the midst of desolation. Because this is what I know, because I've seen God do it in my life over and over and over again. And 2016... Death Valley saw rain, which it sees about once a decade. And this is what Death Valley looks like when it rains. There's all kinds of stuff blooming. This is called in Death Valley, this is called a super bloom. Because there were seeds laced all over that desert ground. And when it rained, boom, boom, boom. It's a beauty. And you, this is what I'm believing just about me. I don't know what God is doing in some of this season. Uh, we haven't seen some of that yet. But in the meantime, Amber and I, we, we lay in bed that we, we're just going to keep working. We're going to keep trusting. We're going to keep waiting. Be, because I, 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 I'm excited about that day. David said it like this in Psalm 27. 13 and 14, he says this, that yet I'm confident that I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm here in the land of the living. Here's the verse that you got to work through. I got to work through. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. If that's where you're at this morning, I, I just want to encourage you. David said it would be a strong and courageous thing to do just to wait. Keep working it. This is what I know, and this is what I've seen in my life, that my obedience is going to be worth the payoff. That I know God is coming. That I know God is going to do something new. you got to know that Loneliness is no lifestyle. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for the hope that we have in you. Thank you so much for these words that we can read uh, of David. These reminders that we get from Solomon that we, we're going to lose our common sense if we don't stay in community. 
God, thank you so much for your faithfulness. For some of us that have been following you for a while, we've, we've seen you come through. So we can stand on the fact that we, we can link and think. We can go back. We can be reminded of what you've done. We, we can know that you're going to do it again, that you're going to show up. And God, for somebody that's new to the faith today, that's wrestling through their feelings, that's what, wrestling through all kinds of emotions, God, God would you, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, allow them to anchor themselves to their faith this morning. God, help us to live this thing out. Help us to model this for the next generation. Help, help them to see uh, us uh, live out true community. Help us to communicate. Help us to be people that are transparent. Help us to be people that, are, that, that talk to you, that trust in you. God, I, I pray over everybody in the room that's in a season of isolation that, that they would come out, that they would talk to you, that they would communicate with others, that you would provide people to walk alongside them. God, in the meantime, my promise, I'm going to keep trusting you. I'm going to keep waiting on you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.